Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of today, 20th of January 2022. Uh, today, uh, we are delighted and honored to host our colleague, uh, Kat Reynolds from Drax uh, Group. Dr. Reynolds is a BECCS a Strategy and Engagement Manager for Drax Group where she acts as the interface between the external affairs, technical and commercial teams and leads external engagement to support the development of the company, the Drax Group, a first BECCS project in the UK and negative emissions technologies globally. Before joining Drax, uh, Kat uh, was senior policy advisor in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy leading on the coordination and delivery of EU exit policy uh, in 2018 to 2020, and was a senior consultant with Wood McKinsey between 2016 and 18, uh, where she delivered a strategy consulting and market advisory projects focusing on decarbonization opportunities in the oil and gas sector. Kat is a geoscientist by training she holds an MSc, Master of Science in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge in UK and an MSc also in Petroleum Geoscience from Imperial College London. She completed a PhD in the multiphase fluid flow properties of CO2 and brine uh, during CO2 storage at Imperial College London in 2016 where she carried out experimental investigations at core and pore scales to characterize the influence of reservoir conditions and pore space heterogeneities on steady state relative permeability. In her current role at Drax, a cat's interests include the development of policy and market mechanisms which support CCS and negative emissions and communicating geoscience concepts to stakeholders quite an impressive and dynamic career she has had from technical aspect of geosciences to policy and then consultancy and now again back to CCS subjects as well. It's, it's our true pleasure and honor to host you, Kat, today. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation. Uh, and to the audience, please note, uh, Kat's lecture would last for about half an hour followed by questions and discussions. Like always, please do type in your questions in the chat box. Sebastian will chair the discussion session and do not please wait until the end of uh, the talk to post your questions. Please do post them whenever you feel appropriate because your question will motivate your colleagues to also engage with the speaker and ask their questions as well. So without any uh, further ado, uh, Kat, the stage is all yours, the bandwidth, most probably, uh, <laughs> properly to say, and the screen is all yours. And we are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Hadi, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you, Sebastian, for the invitation. It's really fantastic to be here uh, speaking at the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar. You've heard from my background. I've started out in academia and then have gone out into the uh, uh, into the corporate world, um, but I'm still involved in CCS broadly. Um, it's fantastic looking through the lineup uh, of speakers that you've had over over the last couple of months uh, to see so many colleagues from my PhD days uh, who, who've spoken at this series before me. So um, I'm really looking forward to bringing a slightly different perspective. Uh, from beyond the academic world um, to this lecture series. I hope it will be interesting, a little bit different from your day to day, um, but really the intention for me is to try to, if not inspire some new direction, but at least uh, help bring to life some of the new stakeholders and new audiences for a lot of the research that all of you uh, watching today are engaged in. As Hadi said, I'm uh, the BEX Strategy and Engagement Manager at Drax Group. I'll give you a little intro into Drax in the next few slides, but um, perhaps I'll, I'll just say first, I'm speaking today in my personal capacity. So um, anything that I share today is not necessarily the view of Drax. Um, but for me today, you know, what's, what's most interesting is that 
I'm finding more and more in my role in the corporate world that actually an understanding of geoscience and geoengineering concepts is becoming more and more important. It's more and more important that we understand them and can communicate them to uh, non-technical audiences. And that's because negative emissions, which are, are, are what uh, Bex project, the Bex project that Drax is developing aims to deliver, negative emissions are now becoming a commodity effectively that companies are thinking about buying and selling. And that means the uh, range of stakeholders that need to understand what gives negative emissions value, and, and ultimately that is permanent geological storage. The range of stakeholders involved in, in that conversation is becoming much wider. So that's really uh, the intention behind my, my talk here today to try and bring to life a few of the drivers behind the growth of negative emissions technologies, some of the uncertainties in, in how big a role they will play, but importantly, what the voluntary carbon market is doing to drive those technologies uh, and why uh, new actors need to understand geoscience and geoengineering concepts. So first, let me introduce Drax quickly. Drax is a UK-based renewable energy company uh, engaged in renewable power generation, the production of sustainable biomass, and the sale of renewable power to businesses. Although increasingly there's a, there's a fourth component to Drax's business, and that is negative emissions. At the moment, Drax owns and operates a, a whole portfolio of renewable power assets, including the biggest power station uh, in Europe, which is the Drax power station just south of York, uh, that runs uh, predominantly on biomass. We also have a set of hydro pumped hydro storage assets, um, uh, as well as a kind of uh, a global biomass pellet production and supply business. Drax is uh, increasingly interested, as I said, in moving beyond renewable power to the, the next big topic in uh, the decarbonization agenda, and that is negative emissions. And we're interested in doing that by converting our power station, at least partially, uh, from being a bioenergy power station to a BEX power station. And we'll do that by uh, retrofitting two of the biomass generation units with carbon capture connecting into a CO2 transport and storage network that will send the CO2 for permanent geological storage. And in so doing, we'll generate both renewable power from biomass, but also negative emissions. Drax is part of one of the first and largest CCUS clusters in the UK, the East Coast cluster which includes carbon capture and storage projects, both uh, in the Teesside area and also in the Humber area where Drax is located in the pink. Um, both of those sets of carbon capture projects will share an offshore transport and storage network that will ultimately connect into first one CO2 storage site, the Endurance Saline Aquifer, and then potentially other um, uh, other offshore storage sites under the North Sea. There'll be a separate operator for that transport and storage network and the offshore storage sites. Um, uh, and all those individual capture projects will have uh, an agreement with that, with that TNS Co, that transport and storage company to safely and securely and permanently store their CO2. If we look in a little bit more detail at what the Humber region of that East Coast cluster looks like, you can see that there's a whole suite of different companies involved, different projects from power generation projects, hydrogen production, heavy industry, steel production, energy from waste, and ultimately negative emissions as well from Drax. All of those different companies, different uh, actors uh, involved in CO2 um, capture, uh, and all of whom will need to have some understanding of the mechanics of what goes on in the CO2 storage sites offshore once they've sent their CO2 into the pipeline. It's important that 
even though all of the companies on here, you know, they won't be the ones operating the storage site, they won't need to make operational decisions, but the implications for how the CO2 is stored has a bearing on the success of their projects. Um, and ultimately it means that petroleum engineering, geoengineering, geoscience concepts uh, increasingly need to be communicated to a much wider range of companies than before. So let's talk a little bit more about negative emissions and, and why they're becoming increasingly important. And this will be familiar to many of you. Um, those of you that were following COP26 at Glasgow last year will know that it managed, despite COVID delays, to deliver pledges that build on Paris era commitments uh, and which ultimately could keep warming below two degrees C. And hopefully if we continue to build on the commitments, could keep 1.5 degrees C within reach as well. Now around 136 countries have set net zero targets and that covers, uh, well, you can see here, 88% of, of emissions in the world, 90% of global GDP, 85% of the world's population. Seems like we're making incredibly positive progress, but it's important to remember that not all targets are equal. Uh, uh, there's quite a considerable variation between what, what net zero means. So firstly, uh, one country's uh, target might not be the same because they have a different year at which, CO2, uh, at which net zero uh, should be reached. For example, Sweden was the first country to uh, set a net zero target, but that's for 2045, whereas the UK's target, net zero target is for 2050. Another difference might be in the range of uh, greenhouse gases that are covered by the target. So both Sweden and the UK include all greenhouse gases in their net zero target. Uh, but China, for example, has a, a carbon neutrality target. So their, their target just covers CO2. And then thirdly, you have to consider what the end goal of a, of a country's target is. For some, net zero is where you want to get to. You just want to get to net zero emissions. But for others, uh, it, it, it's important to go beyond net zero and go to net negative, ultimately. And the reason that's important, because having a different goal for net zero, uh, having a different range of greenhouse gases covered, and having a different ultimate end target, whether that's net zero or net negative, affects the pathway that you take, and it ultimately affects the amount of negative emissions that you might use and that we might need globally. So um, this diagram uh, shows uh, a chart from adapted from the IPCC. Again, it'll be familiar to many of you um, that looks at a particular pathway for getting to net zero and then to net negative, keeping us uh, to 1.5 degrees C. The first task is to reduce emissions, whether that's by improving energy efficiency, uh, by deploying more renewables, increasing electrification, and ultimately reducing fossil fuel use. But despite all of that activity and all of that action to reduce emissions, we know that there are some that just aren't going to be uh, reduced as fast as we want. That might be difficult to remove entirely either because they're very expensive, uh, because the, the technology to decarbonize is expensive, perhaps relative to the product that you're making. For example, uh, cement, um, decarbonized cement might be too expensive to make it as useful a commodity. Um, or perhaps there isn't a, a decarbonization solution yet available. Or in fact, maybe it's just that that particular technology is so pervasive in the global economy that it's very difficult to take fast action to remove those carbon emissions. This is where negative emissions really come in, not as an alternative to reducing emissions, but as a complement that really helps us to maintain or increase the pace of action where otherwise action might be slow. Many of you will also be familiar with these diagrams, I suppose, um, showing that um, the amount of negative emissions that we might ultimately need depend on all these points that I've talked about before in terms of the targets for net zero. So 
the longer we delay in reducing emissions, the longer we delay in, in reaching a, a net zero target, uh, the more likely it is that we'll exceed uh, 1.5 degrees C warming, and the more likely it is that we'll need to deploy more negative emissions uh, and at a faster rate. So to fulfill climate pledges, whether that's at a country level or at a company level, uh, there are three sort of key areas you might want to consider. The first is the scope of the target. What's the uh, range of uh, emissions sources that are being covered? For a country, it might be all of the emissions within th that country's boundary. For a company, it might just be direct emissions that they can control. Uh, you want to consider what are the range of gases that are covered by the target? Is it just CO2 or is it uh, a full range of greenhouse gases? When do you have to reach the target? Is it sooner? Is it later? And all of those things impact on th the methods that you take to reach your net zero target. The second area to consider is fairness. And this applies, again, both at a country level and a company level. Um, uh, and that and that is about considering what uh, um, to, to what degree should a country or a company take action? Should they be uh, just concerned with the emissions and um, activities that are in their direct control, or should they consider how to incentivize action outside of their own sphere of control and really go further? The third area to consider is ultimately the roadmap that you're following, the trajectory that you want to take. How do you measure uh, the progress that you're making? Are there particular milestones that you want to hit? Uh, and ultimately, what is the end goal? On all of these, again, feed into the methods by which you reach net zero or reach net negative and ultimately impact on the amount of negative emissions that we might need to deploy. So let's consider this from a, a company perspective. How might you want to reach your net zero target? The first thing you do is uh, you reduce the, em the emissions that you're um, uh, creating in your business. That might be you know, reducing uh, electricity use. Uh, it might be through fuel switching. Uh, and that's a good start to, to start reducing the emissions that you're actively generating yourself. But some companies, uh, want to go further. They think, well, actually, I can use some of the excess cash that I've got available to incentivize action outside of my direct control uh, and perhaps try and avoid emissions elsewhere. So you might do that by uh, financing a project to uh, increase the uptake of renewable electricity in a particular country or in a particular, particular region. You might want to uh, help protect areas of the world from deforestation, and in so doing, avoid CO2 emissions elsewhere. Lots of companies do this now in, in order to be able to claim climate neutrality. But we know that really to get to net zero, you need to do more than uh, avoid emissions. We need to actively reduce them. So as well as reducing emissions within uh, direct control, companies can go further and actually start to buy carbon removal by negative emissions from elsewhere. Uh, and in so doing, hopefully get to a point where they can claim net zero. Um, on this diagram here, this gives you a sense of the sorts of projects that we're talking about, the, the kinds of projects that are available to companies now that are on uh, that are trying to deliver net zero targets and are on a, on a net zero journey. So many at the minute will look at financing projects that improve, uh, for example, the energy efficiency of cook stoves. That might help you avoid some emissions, but uh, it doesn't ultimately remove carbon from the atmosphere. Others might look at avoided deforestation projects, so protecting areas that are likely to be deforested at the moment. But there's a point at which these avoided emissions uh, solutions saturate. We should hopefully get to a point where we don't need to be uh, protecting areas from deforestation and where many uh, uh, energy efficiency measures um, are, are taken as a matter of course. So financing them no longer makes sense for a company to do if they want to claim they're taking extra action. 
Instead, you want to look at projects that start to actively remo remove CO2 and store it. And uh, the most readily available projects today are short-term storage options like supporting afforestation and reforestation projects. And I say short-term because um, there's there's a, a limited lifetime over which a tree will store uh, carbon before it's uh, returned uh, back to the biosphere into the atmosphere. Ultimately, what you want to do is move towards long-term storage that um, keeps CO2 uh, locked away back in the geosphere for thousands of years. But uh, unfortunately, at the minute, there's a, a, a limited number of these projects available for companies to um, purchase credits from. So there's lots of different uh, types of projects that a company could buy offsets from, whether that's an avoidance project, whether that's a carbon removal project. Uh, it's complex. There are lots of different standards. There's different terminology. How does the company navigate that and, and decide wh whether the action they're taking is enough? Um, well, there are increasingly uh, sets of voluntary standards or frameworks that are being developed to help companies navigate this world, uh, one of which uh, is, is the one shown here, the Oxford Principles for Net Zero Aligned Carbon Offsetting. And these principles um, help countries to, first of all, frame the action that they're taking now, define it correctly, but also to progressively improve the action that they're ta taking uh, and um, uh, increasingly move from emission reduction to carbon removal. So first of all, if a company is assessing a project, they might use the flowchart here to decide whether it's an emissions reduction project, decide whether it's a carbon removal project, and look at the length of time that it's stored. And in a, in a portfolio of offsets at the moment, you might want to start with what's available in the marketplace now. So you might start with avoided emissions projects or, or projects with low amounts uh, or short-lived carbon storage. But ultimately, you'd be looking at trying to move your portfolio of offsets, offsets so that you are mainly purchasing long-lived carbon removals. What does that look like over time? Well, um, this, is a, this is one way of showing it, um, where here uh, in 2020, for example, if you're a company with a net zero strategy, you might just have avoidance projects or maybe carbon removal with short-lived storage. So supporting your cookstove projects, supporting um, afforestation and reforestation projects. You might start to um, work carbon capture and storage into your business, for example, if you're an industrial um, company that can add in CCS and so uh, introduce emissions reduction with long-lived storage. That's number three on this. Uh, chart. But ultimately, you might want to go further and start to buy active carbon removals with long-lived storage from, for example, a BEX project, Bioenergy with CCS project, or a DAX project, a director capture project. Here's another way uh, of looking at that, showing um, the uh, emissions balance for a particular company on their uh, net zero pathway. Today, you might be able to claim carbon neutrality by offsetting all of your uh, residual emissions by buying the same equivalent volume in carbon avoidance projects. But over time, we want to see progressively less uh, avoidance projects and more carbon removal projects. And the reason for this is that shifting towards long-lived uh, carbon removal projects with geological storage will do the most to rebalance uh, what we've been doing for the last 100 years in terms of um, moving CO2 from uh, the geosphere via fossil fuels into the atmosphere. So on the left-hand side, diagrams like this help uh, understand corporate actors where CO2 is being moved to and from. Um, in using fossil fuels, we're moving CO2 from the geosphere into the atmosphere. And by supporting uh, projects such as reforestation and afforestation, we can start to move CO2 back out of the atmosphere into land and, and, and biosphere storage. But ultimately, we need to connect uh, back into the geosphere and start to move CO2 back to where it came from. Uh, so ultimately, we want to be deploying uh, fewer 
um, projects that have land and, and biosphere based storage and, and more projects that have geological carbon storage. So what scale of neg negative emissions do we need to reach? Well, taking estimates from uh, McKinsey, uh, from a group called the Network for Greening the Financial System and from the IPCC, uh, it looks like from about 0.1 gigatons of negative emissions today, covering nature-based and, and engineered solutions, we need to scale up to somewhere in the region of half a gigaton to just over a gigaton of negative emissions in 2025. Now that's an order of magnitude change in less than five years. It's equivalent to removing uh, all of the CO2 that the global aviation sector uh, puts out today. It's a huge, huge challenge, um, but the scale of the challenge gets even bigger. Um, by 2050, we need to go from about one gigaton up to five to 10 gigatons of negative emissions. How close are we to meeting those targets? Well, if we take uh, current rates of, uh, for example, afforestation projects and reforestation projects, if we add up all the technological negative emissions projects that are in existence and are planned to be operational in the next four or five years, uh, then we find that the current pipeline of negative emissions projects will take us to about 150 million tons. That's still a pretty long way off the kind of 500 to, uh, million tons to, to one gigaton of, of negative emissions that we need um, by 2025. So knowing we need to do more to scale up uh, negative emission solutions that have long duration geological storage, let's have a quick look at some of the projects that are operating today and, and planned to be in operation. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about DRAX. There are other BEX projects, uh, some in Sweden, uh, that are planned to be operating within the next three to four years. There's an existing BEX project that captures 1 million tons of CO2 per year uh, in the US. And there are also direct air capture projects in the US uh, and in Iceland um, that are starting to either capture and store CO2 now at small scales, as in the case of the Climeworks project, uh, or, or are planning to be uh, operating at kind of commercial industrial scale within the next five years. So we're starting to see companies enter the, the negative emissions space and develop projects, but we're far from the number of companies and projects that we need to reach the scales that cli climate models and uh, net zero targets say we need to get to. So how do we incentivize these projects? Uh, there's three key ways. First, government targets. So uh, governments having uh, net uh, negativity targets or having ambitions for certain volumes of negative emissions uh, really starts to send signals to the market, send signals to developers that they need to bring forward more projects. Um, we could look to introduce negative emissions into obligation schemes and in so, um, in so doing mean that uh, particular industrial sectors have access to negative emissions uh, and can use them to um, uh, neutralize uh, their emissions uh, um, uh, through existing emissions trading schemes, through existing market mechanisms. And then ultimately we can use voluntary schemes um, to incentivize uh, uh, the uptake of negative emissions. And this is an area where we're seeing uh, increasing amounts of action. The sorts of companies though that are interested in buying negative emissions and have committed to do so uh, are not typically high emitting um, sectors. They're usually consumer brands or uh, companies with um, uh, uh, good ESG credentials, ones that have a lot of spare uh, cash that they can spend in speculating and generating uh, interest in new markets. So uh, companies like uh, Audi and Acado have, have both purchased uh, negative emissions uh, credits, uh, usually on the small scale, sort of single year purchases, less than a thousand tons. And th these are you know, consum consumer brands that know that their um, customers uh, uh, will be interested in their 
climate strategies. There are also uh, sort of services companies in the middle. So Swiss Ray, the reinsurance company and BCG, the consultancy firm that uh, are also starting to purchase negative emissions. These tend to be bigger purchases, multi-year purchases. Uh, and these are companies that are uh, interested in uh, using this activity both to offset their own emissions, but also to generate more interest from clients uh, and to help them expand their own offerings uh, in, in uh, uh, net zero strategy offerings. And then the ones that are, um, uh, I suppose, doing most to purchase negative emissions are typically tech firms um, who are not just buying for themselves, but really trying to promote the growth of the market and explore where it could go. So to look at Microsoft uh, in a little bit more detail, Microsoft have paid for uh, the largest amount of removals uh, in the voluntary carbon markets. They've um, procured over a million tons of negative emissions in 2021 uh, as part of a long-term strategy, not just to reach uh, net zero emissions, but to neutralize the company's historic emissions too. So really going beyond what is part of a traditional uh, net zero, even net negative pathway uh, for companies. But they went out to the market and, and they said, well, let's test what's available. Let's, let's ask uh, projects to come forwards uh, and um, bid to be part of, our, uh, part of our strategy. And when Microsoft did that, what they found is, uh, first of all, they received about 200 proposals uh, delivering uh, 150 million tons of, of negative emissions. But actually, when you look in a bit more detail, uh, less uh, about a third of those um, were actually available now for delivery now to offset emissions today. And actually worse than that, only about 2 million tons of that 150 million tons worth of proposals that they received um, were actually uh, up to Microsoft's standards for what would constitute a high quality negative emission where they could clearly demonstrate that action was being taken, that there was a clear carbon accounting method, that there were clear monitoring methods and that ultimately um, the negative emissions purchased would be long lasting and durable. Stripe for in something similar. Um, uh, again, they had a, a slightly smaller procurement process and for them, their key requirement was that the projects that came forwards to be part of their uh, procurement process needed to be demonstrating long-term storage. Uh, and in reality, they found that the vast, vast majority of um, negative emissions credits that can be bought today are from projects that have short-term storage only. So there are a few problems in the voluntary carbon market at the minute. Uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation um, where the supply side uh, is starting to get there, but it can't scale up until there is clear demand and a specific um, uh, set of criteria for that supply to meet. At the minute, there is limited consensus on, on what a good high quality negative emissions project uh, might look like. On the demand side, similarly, it's, it's difficult to uh, come forward and say you want some negative emissions if you're not sure what the range of solutions are and how, how you can use them. And then in the middle, all the market infrastructure that might support um, projects, uh, project developers and potential purchasers of negative emissions come together, that sort of market infrastructure is unlikely to scale up until the other two pieces move forwards too. But what that means is that there are a whole range of new actors who need to understand uh, geological storage concepts, um, who need to be able to talk uh, uh, and characterize storage, storage security, uh, storage duration. You need to understand how you would monitor and, and prove that once you've captured and stored some CO2, it stays there. Um, if you take uh, a single negative emissions project developer, although they might be the ones that are generating a credit for the negative emissions that they, for the carbon that they capture and the, the negative emissions they create, 
uh, they will also have a relationship with a storage company um, that will uh, help them to deliver their negative emissions. They'll have to follow a set of standards, hopefully, for the project that make it clear the criteria they need to follow. They might have a relationship with uh, an intermediary, a, a broker that would uh, buy lots of negative emissions credits before selling them on to buyers who also need to understand the quality of, of what they're purchasing. So there are a whole host of new, uh, uh, I suppose, um, stakeholders that are needing to understand geoscience concepts. And just to go through those um, uh, pretty quickly, uh, first, trapping mechanisms. For, for geologists, diagrams like these are, are really clear. They start to show you the types of trapping mechanisms that work when you store CO2 underground. But if you're not from a geoscience background, these diagrams don't mean very much. It's, it's not very clear um, what those mechanisms do, how long they last, how you prove it, how, ca how can you tell that that's happening in the storage site that you buy a project from. The next thing is leakage rates, and this is usually the thing that I get asked about most often. How likely is it that CO2 might leak out of a storage site? How can you measure it? How much would leak out? And critically, that question of how much CO2 would leak out is a really important one for commercial projects that are thinking about, well, ultimately, what is the long-term liability if there was a problem with my CO2 storage site? I need to understand the volumes that we're talking about and what that would mean for me financially. Beyond the kind of buying and selling of, of negative emissions projects, uh, negative emissions developers, project developers, so BEX project developers and DAX project developers, need to understand where CO2 storage is. And again, this is something that um, on the face of it is, is simple to understand if you're a geologist, but very difficult if you're uh, coming from um, a different uh, engineering sector. So understanding the types of storage that are available to you, whether that's in saline aquifers or perhaps mineral storage in basalts, uh, and understanding how well uh, characterize the available storage is? How do you go from a, a regional assessment down to actually identifying a new, a new site uh, and a new place to locate your project? It's particularly important where you're thinking about projects that have um, multiple complex requirements. For example, BEX projects where you want to be located near to both uh, a biomass feedstock, so potentially a, a forestry sector or an agricultural sector, as well as being located near to a storage site that has um, suitable uh, characteristics that allow you to operate a project, the project in, in a way that is um, commercially viable. And then finally, how do you start to talk about uh, the maturity of CO2 storage sites. Once you go from a, a regional scale and start moving, moving down and narrowing down your options towards individual storage sites, how easily can you convey information about how well understood and how well designed the project is? I, I quite like this um, example here of, of borrowing the concept of technology readiness levels and applying that to storage sites to say, how close is your storage site uh, to uh, commercial operation. Uh, it's interesting that most um, storage sites, uh, uh, there are, uh, for, for storage sites in development in the UK today, there are around about the six, seven storage readiness level here. Um, there's nothing at all in the sort of three to five buckets. And then you've got a whole host of, of large scale kind of regional studies in the storage readiness level one and two bucket. So it's really important that we start to move projects uh, along the scale and make sure that that is accessible um, to project developers outside uh, of the geoscience world. And then just two slides to, to finish off quickly. I suppose one of the things I, I come across most often is, is the difficulty in communicating what are really uh, technical concepts to um, to a non-technical audience, to a kind of commercial audience, people that want to make quick decisions and 
uh, understand clearly what the risks and liabilities are without having to go and do a PhD themselves. And uh, one of the things I often turn to when talking about CO2 storage is uh, an open letter that was written uh, a couple of years ago now for, for COP21 explaining the security of CO2 storage and, and the science behind it. And this um, is fantastic because it has some clear statements, some clear points that are being made. There is supporting evidence to, uh, for you to go and look at if you want more detail. But importantly, it's accessible somewhere that's that's not behind a paywall, that's not in an academic journal. Uh, it means that um, people beyond the research community might be able to um, consume it and, and, and understand what it means. And that's really important. So final slide, just to finish off. Um, some of the questions that uh, I get asked uh, in my role and um, that are, of course, very active areas of research at the minute are, are shown in the left-hand side. Um, the audience that knows a lot about this already outside of the research community are CO2 storage site operators. But increasingly, it is a whole suite of other actors that need to understand these concepts and be engaging with them. Uh, and most have a very low level of integration in, into um, these research topics and a low level uh, of understanding of, of what they mean for their projects. So um, I suppose uh, today I'd just like to offer a, um, not quite a plea, but an ask for all of you to consider when you're uh, reporting your research results, how you do it, where you do it, is there a way of making it accessible and usable to an audience beyond the research community? Um, because it's really with that kind of information sharing that we can accelerate progress both in CCS uh, and in negative emissions technologies. So with that, I think I will stop sharing my slides and invite any questions. Thank you very much for this fascinating and very informative uh, lecture. You covered plenty, plenty topics <laughs> and received plenty questions also as right. a reward. So I'm not going to take any moment, just uh, give the floor to Sebastian to pick up the questions. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you, Kat, also from my side. Absolutely super talk and um, so timely, so pertinent. And as Hadi said, there are and there's a tremendous amount of really good questions and trying to group them a little bit. And I start with the first one from one of our regular viewers, um, Yuang Wang, um, who says, thank you for the informative talk. CCS being looked at as a promising negative emission technology. However, there exist not many successful CCS projects at the moment. What do you think are we still missing um, to scale up this technology? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, having been in the in the research world a few years ago, thinking about these these questions myself, um, I suppose, to me, it's not really a question of um, technology that's missing. Uh, I think um, from the projects that are operating from the vast body of research that's out there and, and lots of parallels that can be drawn in the oil and gas world, the, the technology exists and is proven. It's really a, a case of finding the right uh, commercial and regulatory incentives for these projects. That tends to have been the, the really the key blocker. So the single, you know, the couple of projects that we have that are operating, there are projects that have been operating for a long time, mm. but there are very specific uh, policy incentives or, or sets of regulations that mean uh, they work and they work commercially, not that they work technically. Um, I think there's a lot being done now to try and unblock that. In particular, in the UK, the UK was last interested in CO2 storage in probably the early 2010s. Uh, and that failed for a number of reasons, and partly because the sort of the, the risk structure, the liability structure meant that all of the parts of a, of a CCS project from the capture, um, you know, for example, a Drax developing a BEX project, you might have the capture. Um, you, you might be in control of the capture part, but you, you you ended up being liable for the risk in the CO2 storage site, despite the fact that you weren't the CO2 storage operator. 
Whereas now we're starting to see the development of regulatory structures that mean that um, the capture project is is separate uh, in some way uh, from the storage project so that you don't take on risks for different part, parts of the CCS chain. And that sort of mechanism is really starting to help projects to come forward. And it's partly why we're seeing so many projects uh, in the UK now. The way that they're incentivized in different countries will be different. For example, the US uh, tax breaks, tax incentive mechanisms tend to be much more um, seen as investable prospects uh, because uh, sort of tax mechanisms are, are, are seen as more certain and longer lasting than they are in the UK. Um, but I think increasingly we'll start to see more and more development of um, novel kind of policy and regulatory structures that help incentivize these projects. It is really not a question of technology for me. It's, it's really one of that sort of policy and, and regulatory aspects. Great. Thank you. Your answer is a wonderful segue into um, a question from Neil Price. And I think you may have partly um, answered this already. But um, he says, does the carbon offset market require a carbon credit system to monetize the stored carbon? Is that close from a policy view? You talked about policy, but how do you actually pay for it? And then how do you incentivize people to uh, companies to to make that investment? What is missing here? Yeah, it, it, it does require a carbon credit system. When it when it comes to negative emissions, it requires you to have a value for negative emissions. You know, we have a carbon price now, but uh, that doesn't hasn't quite translated to a price for negative emissions. So if you're a, a negative emissions project developer, you don't get paid for delivering those negative emissions yet. We don't yet have uh, sort of structures that mean you value uh, the negative emissions in the same way that you might value capturing CO2 rather than releasing it. So uh, translating that kind of concept of carbon credits from uh, emissions reduction projects into negative emissions projects uh, is, is really the kind of essential piece. And that's been recognized um, uh, certainly in the UK and, and in other countries as a key missing piece that has um, acted as a real blocker to the development of these projects. Because without that, you don't see the commercial value in in bringing them forwards. Moving on from sort of the the commercial, the policy um, angle to something that's much closer to the not in my backyard approach. There's some really interesting questions here. Odd Anders, it's not in my backyard question, but he says, no, common to all now net emission technologies that they need to be scaled up enormously with poorly understood side effects. How confident are we? that um, NET can ever scale up to the levels suggested in these scenarios, especially if it then becomes much closer to where we live and we have backs in our backyard. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. We, we don't know how, how, how far these technologies can scale, if they're going to reach the scale that we think we might need. We don't really know what scale we, we need to deploy them at. I think the key, uh, though, is that they won't ever scale unless we start. You, you do have to start somewhere. It's important to uh, have that learning by doing. Um, if we spend too long testing projects, thinking about the, the theoretical versions of them before moving towards deployment, you miss real opportunities to uh, uh, gain that practical understanding uh, and, and a clear understanding of where the problems might be and and, uh, and what else you need to consider in order to scale them more. So that's, that's really critical. And um, kind of a, a worry about how, um, how widely you need to deploy negative emissions technologies. Um, I suppose it comes back to that point about how much action do we delay uh, in terms of emissions reduction and how does that feed into uh, how, how, how large a volume of negative emissions you need? The longer we wait to find out whether we need them, the more likely it is that we need them. So it's important to start moving forwards and, and really positively um, build evidence and build experience so that we can use them more effectively. Uh, it's better to find out sooner that if we don't think they're going to reach uh, a scale that keeps us on 1.5 degrees, it's better to know that now than it is to think that that's a, a solution we've got in our back pockets for 2050. That's clearly the, the practical person you were speaking, not the scientist who <laughs> wants to research <laughs> until the <laughs> bitter end. Um, we're staying on, on backs, there's some really great question and on that 
technology near prices. No, thank you, Kat, for great introductory interactive view on BEX and the fledging offset market. What do local residents think of BEX on that doorstep, especially if it you know, if we scale it up? How is public yeah. acceptance? Public acceptance is a really interesting question. I think for Drax specifically, we have huge amounts of support for the projects in the local area. It's It's been a part of that local area for a long time. Uh, it's a big regional employer. It's part of a, a regional set of uh, heavy industry and, and power generation. So it's it's seen as a kind of core um, part of that region's identity and being able to demonstrate that it's um, that Drax is moving forwards. Started out as a as a coal fired power station. Now is a is a biomass um, fired power station and moving forwards to negative emissions is a really really important. Um, uh, spotlight on a, a perhaps a region of the UK that is often left behind in favor of mm. you know in favor of London for example so it's really important um, to demonstrate that decarbonization opportunities and advances can happen in all parts of the UK and that's something that um, uh, the residents uh, uh, in in the Yorkshire area are, uh, respond really really positively to um, there are, you know, lots of questions about uh, more broadly in terms of the acceptance of of negative emissions technologies, about where they should be deployed and 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 how you um, how you balance that against concerns. And it is concerns from members of the public. And it is incredibly important that you engage and um, really communicate as much as possible about what's going on, what it might mean for the area. Uh, positives and negatives and any actions you have to take and you make sure that everyone um, collectively agrees that's that's the right thing to do and it's interesting because it will be it will be very different in different countries and also different parts of the country as I said um, you know the, the sort of Humber area is already an industrial area it's used to that those kinds of projects as you seeing power stations big industrial projects on the horizon you wouldn't want to deploy a BEX project somewhere that, that wasn't used to that sort of industry, perhaps, where that might uh, come with um, more uh, questions, perhaps more criticism from, from local residents. Um, there's also a question about which um, negative emissions uh, solutions are suited to particular areas. So if you're, for example, um, a very agricultural area, you have lots of agricultural residues, uh, it's clear that there's a link to um, BEX there and, and um, it tends to be uh, much much simpler and much easier to communicate the benefit of, of having that project in areas like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a really great question, a, a really important one. And it's something that I think, uh, again, we'll see increasing, increasing focus on in the UK as, as CCS projects and negative emissions projects are developed um, an increasing focus on community engagement and, and really making sure that everyone understands the implications of the projects uh, and, and the benefits that they bring to local areas. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think also the, the opportunities for creating jobs in regions like the Humber regions or Aberdeen um, that have seen a yeah. decline in, in the job and the availability of jobs is, is a big, possible big attractor there. Um, you talked about Bex and Marcia Bone um, says it seems some of, as a question, it, said, um, it seems some of the Bex projects have been cancelled due to difficulties in obtaining the permissions as well as the economic viability. Would you sh please share your assessment on this? Uh, so I, I suppose I don't know which which Bex projects you're referring to, um, but I suppose like any big industry project, there's a whole host of uh, very intensive sort of permissions um, processes that have have to be uh, uh, gone through in, in order to develop projects, and and they're different uh, in different parts of the UK, in different parts of the world. They typically uh, um, typically there's a need to demonstrate very clearly the commercials of the projects, but also very clearly demonstrate your plan for uh, construction, your your plan for um, monitoring uh, and reducing any environmental impacts during the construction of the project and the operation of the project. And at all parts of those processes, there's a high burden of evidence, a high burden of proof that projects really have to develop. Um, I think because there are so few in existence right now, there is, again, a lot of learning by doing. It can be difficult to 
uh, describe and, and convey the things that are, are have to be done or, or project developers think they need to do in order to bring a project forwards. Um, so I think there's a, a, a real um, emphasis that we then need to, to give to information sharing so that projects understand how to uh, improve the projects and the plans that they're developing and that, that will ultimately support um, positive approvals. Um, so I'm, I'm, and I'm afraid I don't know what the specifics are of these ones, but it, it's definitely, um, uh, you know, a very critical part of, of any project. And again, when it's a new sort of industry and, and there's not lots of, you know, evidence and comparisons you can draw on, that does make it difficult uh, when it comes to, to demonstrating the things that you have to demonstrate in order to get sort of planning permission and, and, and that's, uh, um, uh, and those sorts of approvals. Um, over the line but that but that's that's as it should be that's right it should be a high burden of proof it should be a high burden of evidence and projects have to work harder to deliver that if they want if we want to have VEX projects uh, commercially operating thank you um let's move so to some technologies may could help us to um, further a step change towards net um negative emission technologies um one of your fellow Imperial College alumni, Jean Mays, asks, hi, Kat, thanks for the great presentation. The UK government is looking closely at hydrogen bags. Do you believe this technology has potential? Yeah, so I suppose BEX more broadly um, is, uh, is a really fascinating uh, technology because there are so many different outputs that you could have from it, different energy outputs, different ways of converting biomass to, to, to energy. Uh, and for Drax, the main one that we're looking at is power, power generation, but we're interested in all sorts of BEX conversions. And hydrogen absolutely is, is one that has um, potential. I think that um, it is much further down the sort of technology re readiness uh, levels at the minute. There's there's quite a lot of, uh, a lot more to do in terms of demonstrating the scale, demonstrating the efficiencies uh, and, um, really really showing the the kind of the the, the benefits of of um bex hydrogen production but absolutely i think there's potential there um in some ways with bex the difficulty is that there are so many options you have to think about well what are the solutions that we're really trying to optimize for and that's actually quite difficult when you're balancing a project that has these sort of multiple co-products, multiple co-benefits. So even if you're looking at a, a simple kind of BEX power project, you're delivering both negative emissions and power. And you have to make sure that you're uh, balancing the, the, the design of that project so that you are maximizing both, hopefully, but it might be that you want to maximize one or other of those products. And um, there's elements of that that I think play into um, uh, the development of um, Bex hydrogen. Thank you. Here's a great, we're coming close to the end, but there's a really great question, I think, from um, Edis Buka. It says, great talk. What is your view on the concerns in some quarters that I guess any form of CCS would allow business as usual to continue or even increase since it serves as a mitigation? So rather, example, yes, rather than insulating our homes, we then um, invest into ground source heat pumps. We just by the carbon offset through CCS projects elsewhere. So what is that a Buddhist, what, what are your views on this? It, it's it's a, another really great question. And it's a concern that a lot of people have, you know, the ability to uh, offset CO2 emissions, does that actually serve as a, a, a way to reduce ambition because you don't need to reduce emissions so much. We can We can do the job elsewhere. We can offset somewhere else. So it, it's really absolutely essential that that isn't the case, that you make sure that reductions are always your number one priority. And I think certainly at a global level uh, and, and uh, at company levels as well, you see uh, a kind of clear um, uh, set of, well, targets at national level for, for emissions reductions, and those always have to be the primary targets. It's the same for companies too. And then, you know, you, then if, if you if you're meeting those targets, then you can go further. Then you can think about offsetting. Then you can think about uh, carbon removals. And for companies that don't necessarily have um, standards that they have to adhere to, there's the development of voluntary standards that really sort of um, put that um, criteria for a sort of um, 
high quality of action on them. You kind of you want to incentivize um, people to recognize that uh, reductions um, have to come first. And again, this comes um, back to the question of uh, can we reach the scale that we need with negative emissions technology as well? If we don't do the reduction piece first, then almost certainly no. We we have to do that reduction piece, and th and and then uh, uh, then you look at the role that negative emissions technologies can play. So I think it's a great question, and and the answer has to be always focus on reductions first, uh, and then it's a question of where else you can go. Thank you. I'm going to sneak in one very quick final question just to help clarifying something to possibly some of our audience members. So Anke Dermott says, um, interesting, I always thought that climate neutral is a synonym for net zero, i.e. that it means no contributing to climate change. Or can the emissions of CO2 be climate neutral, something you mentioned in your very early slides? Yeah, yeah. it's a great question. And, and I think the answer is that there isn't a clear set of definitions that are used consistently, certainly in the corporate world. Companies mean lots of different things when they say climate neutral, carbon neutral, climate positive, carbon negative. They, you know, the you might uh, you might think there were clear definitions for each of them, that, and for individual companies, they might know what their definition is, but that doesn't necessarily translate because these are sort of voluntary ways of defining how your business operates. It, there isn't necessarily um, uh, criteria that can be um, compared. There is a lot of work to improve that in the corporate world to try to have standards that people adhere to you so you can sort of sign up and say you know i subscribe to this particular set of standards i use these definitions and and, and that helps people compare between uh companies but the the difficult fact at the minute is that that a lot um of companies use uh words and phrases that mean one thing to one company and one thing to another so actually being able to delve a little bit more into the detail and really prove what um uh, ensure that companies can prove what it is that they're saying and m make clear the definitions that they're using uh, that's a really important part of improving the integrity of, of the voluntary carbon market thank you well thank you very much again kat for a fantastic talk and answering a lot of really good questions um with so much diligence and there are probably another dozen questions that um the audience would like to ask me could go on for another half an hour easily but you know that hardy wants to have dinner at one point he's an hour ahead of us so we keep it there thank you to the audience for some great questions apologies if we couldn't um, put all your questions to cat and again thank you Kat, for a great talk hardy over to you yes for thanks a lot uh, really enjoyed this conversation like everybody else uh, in this call so i'd like to take the chance to introduce our next week uh, distinguished speaker uh, we are hosting next week uh, Professor Jan Main from the University of Edinburgh. And the title of uh, Jan's lecture will be about catastrophic failure of earth materials, sound and vision. So is, we are going to shift a little bit towards more technical talks about rock mechanics. And uh, thanks once more, Kat, for uh, delivering such an informative and a very comprehensive talk. No problem. And to the audience, please... Uh, Stay happy, healthy, and also tuned in to our channel. Next week, 27th of January, we will host you all and our speaker for another geoscientific and geoenergetic topic. Uh, stay happy and healthy again. All the best and see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.